on. Amen. Look at your neighbor and wish them a happy 13th anniversary. Come on. Greet your neighbor. Happy 13th anniversary. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, the theme for our anniversary this year is paradigm shift. Everybody say paradigm shift. Now, look, this is not just, uh, we're not, we didn't just come up with, try to come up with a good theme that would be catchy. This is absolutely significant for the coming year. Can somebody say amen? I really believe it's absolutely significant. Paradigm shift. Tell your neighbor, put your hand on your, put your hand on the shoulder of your neighbor and tell them, you're about to have a paradigm shift. Come on. You're about to have a paradigm shift. Something is going to happen. I believe that. I believe that. It's a prophetic word for us. Let, let me give you a couple of uh, definitions of paradigm shift so you can understand what we're talking about. And then we're going to just read uh, maybe one passage of Scripture and talk about some of the things we believe that God wants to do in the coming year. Paradigm shift. Uh, these are from, uh, uh, well, from the Internet, from Wikipedia, from various dictionaries of what the term or the phrase paradigm shift means. Paradigm shift means, listen, a fundamental change in basic concepts. A fundamental change in basic concepts. So in other words, when a paradigm shift comes into your life, into your heart, into your mind, even some of the things that you thought were foundational, some of the things that you thought were fundamental, those things are shifted. And there's a change. Brings about phenomenal change. Let me talk, and before I give you some more definitions, let, let me talk about what paradigm shift means in the scientific world. It's, it's used quite a bit in the scientific world, in fact. You know, many, many centuries ago, now we think, when, when I'm, what I'm about to say you'll think was silly, but centuries ago, the great majority of the world, and listen, we've been, this, this planet's been around for thousands of years, at least 6,000 years, right? Like only two, three hundred centuries ago, which is not that, I mean, two or three hundred uh, years ago, which is not that long ago, the great majority of people on the planet used to believe that the earth was flat. Did you know that? For, for thousands of years, the great majority of people believed that the earth was flat. And then somehow they were, you know, I can't even remember who it was, whether it was, I don't know if it was Aristotle or whoever it was. Or some, somebody came up with, the, say, somebody discovered that the earth is not flat, but the earth is actually a round sphere. And, and when they began to understand that, it caught, everybody say, paradigm shift. Let's say paradigm shift. So you see, they used to believe, they used to believe that it was the sun that was actually moving, that the sun would rise and the sun would go down. But when they began to understand that the world was round, it changed the whole way that they thought about how the seasons work, about how night and day works, and that the earth is now right. There was a paradigm shift in the minds of the scientists. Suddenly they begin to see things differently. Everything changes. Your perspective changes when there's a paradigm shift that takes place. So paradigm shift, a fundamental change in basic concepts. Another definition, paradigm shift, a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something changes. Yung, yung kadalasan, yung normal way, the acceptable way of doing something or thinking about something, it changes. Biglang may pagbabago. That's a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift, an important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. Everybody say, a new and different way. I tell you what, there's a new and different way that God wants to do things in and through our lives, in and through our church. Now, let me say this. The Word of God never changes. God's Word never changes. God's Word is eternal. When God spoke His Word, Jesus said this, my, uh, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Word of God never changes. But the way we do things have to change. And if we do things the same old, same old way, then we're going to be getting the same old, same old results. And, and in fact, those results will almost always be diminishing results. If you do the same thing over and over again, most likely down the road somewhere, there will be diminishing results. I, you know, I just watched a video on uh, YouTube uh, 
night before last, I think it was, uh, there's, a, there's a channel. I don't know if anybody, the, the techies out there, the geeks. Is there any geeks out here, techies, that uh, subscribe to Cold Fusion? The Cold Fusion channel? Oh, I just love that channel. Cold Fusion is a techno- technological channel on YouTube. And, and they showed how computers have progressed from the early 20s and 30s. They used to be, computers were actually mechanical machines. And then somebody figured out that, uh, that you could break all numbers in the world down to ones and zeros. And so they made these pieces of cardboard that represented ones and zeros, and they could compute with mechanical machines. And then little by little, things began to change. Things be- now, now it is moving so rapidly, so rapidly. The power of, uh, of technology and computing is running so rapidly. Things are changing very fast. Very fast, faster than they've ever changed before. When you think about it, hundreds of years ago, basically, you, you know, you go back two, three hundred years, and those two, three hundred years, for, for hundreds of years and thousands of years, ba- things were basically the same. The whole world was an agricultural world. The whole world was a, a world that had horses, and then, then they discovered chariots and, and, and things like that, you know. But, but those things, basically things stayed, remained almost the same for th- literally thousands of years. And then everybody say, suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly there has become a paradigm shift, and things are moving very, very rapidly. Now, that's the history of the world, but I'm not talking about the history of the world. I'm talking about your life and my life and what God wants to do in the church. Can somebody say amen? amen? It takes a paradigm shift. And I'm talking about in our church. It takes a paradigm shift to change that we can move rapidly. So a paradigm shift is when something is replaced by a new and different way. A paradigm shift is a major change in, some, in how some process is accomplished. A major change in, some, in how some process is accomplished. Now, I've shared this, uh, uh, this story before, but it really works with my message. And that's uh, the whole idea that uh, Henry Ford had an idea the, uh, Henry Ford was not actually the inventor of the automobile. He wasn't actually the inventor. Uh, the automobile was uh, invented by the guys who did the Mercedes-Benz in Germany. But what Henry Ford did, Henry Ford got an idea. Everybody say an idea. An, an idea is a powerful thing. Amen? An idea is a powerful, powerful thing. H- Henry Ford got the idea that he could manufacture automobiles and that that there would come a day when every American would have their own car. And when he said that, people laughed at him because in those days, only the wealthy of the wealthy could afford motorized vehicles. Not only did he manufacture the cars, not only did his vision come to pass, but he changed manufacturing for the entire industry, for the entire world. Henry Ford was the one who came up with the idea of the assembly line. It was a paradigm shift that not only changed the automotive industry and brought us cars, but it was a paradigm shift that changed all manufacturing worldwide until today. They're still using the idea of the assembly line. I tell you what, another fascinating uh, video to watch is the assembly lines for uh, uh, Apple products in China. There's a, there's a couple of videos out. Um, I can't remember, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. But, but it tells about the assembly lines that are almost a mile long to put together an iPad. <laughs> it's just amazing. Thousands of Chinese people all, and all just putting in their part and pass, passing in their part, passing it on. Pers- putting in their part and passing it on. There's a paradigm shift that can come to pass in our hearts and our lives, in our church. I believe 2017 is going to be a year of... Tell your neighbor, 2017 is a year of change. Now, I want to read a passage from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, and the words of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 18, and verse 3. The words of Jesus. Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, 
unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Now, here's something I find interesting. Uh, the Apostle Paul actually rebukes us a number of times in the New Testament writings of Paul. He actually rebukes us for acting like children. And the great majority of us would think that becoming older, becoming more mature is a greater advantage than to becoming a child. Yet Jesus in this passage says something interesting here. I'm talking about paradigm shifts. I'm talking about changing the way that we think. In the kingdom, there, there are many opposites in the kingdom of God. I mean, what I mean is that there's thing, uh, things, that are, things that are true in, in this world are oftentimes opposite in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you know, the world tells you this. The world tells you that if you want to become a success, if you want to become a leader, if you want to become uh, prosperous and successful, then you just fight and climb and grab your way and just, you know, you, you do everything. You can push other people aside. You just through sheer determination, you know, step, step on people. You climb the ladder of success now. And, and while you're climbing the ladder of success, you're stepping on everybody else. But Jesus said it's opposite in the kingdom of God. Those who want to be the greatest become the servants of all. It's totally opposite. In the kingdom of God, I'm talking about paradigm shift. I'm talking about something that changes in your heart, in your mind, that brings phenomenal advancement in your life, in your church, in your ministry, in your business, in your home. I'm talking about a, a, a shift in your basic concepts that brings about enormous change to your life. Something has to shift. Something has to change. In the, in, in the world, the world tells us if you want to become prosperous, if you want to become ses- successful, then you've got to get and get and get and get and get at iponimu lahat, sabi nga ni Pastor Ricky, put it, put it all in a can and sit on the can. Get all you can and can all that you get. That's the world's idea of becoming prosperous. The kingdom of God is just the opposite. Absolutely, totally the opposite. It takes a paradigm shift. It takes something to happen in the heart and the mind to begin to understand the principles of the kingdom of God that will bring about significant change in your life. In the, in the kingdom of God, the more you give, the more you receive. It's just the opposite. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense in the natural you, you, the more you give away, the more the windows of heaven are opened over your life. And the blessing, the prosperity, the favor of God will cause you to increase and overflow with abundance. Can you say amen? amen. Things are opposite in the kingdom of God. So Jesus makes this interesting statement. You know, and obviously there is, uh, in the word of God, in, in the writings of Apostle Paul, there is, uh, there, there is a... Uh, a principle of maturity, a principle of leaving babyhood. But Jesus makes this interesting statement. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. I want to give you three things about little children that I think that Jesus is referring to. I mean, obviously, he's not referring to uh, being whining, crying babies. Hello. <laughs> this is not what he's talking about. Amen? <laughs> being whining, crying babies is not... Is not what he's talking about here. And he, obviously, he's not talking about, you know, kid, if, you have, if you ever had kids, especially if they're toddlers, toddlers can make a mess. He's not talking about making a mess of your life. So what's he talking about when he says, you have to become like little children. You have to, everybody say change. Everybody say change. Tell your neighbor, unless you change, you'll never enter. 
unless you change, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. So the change is not, listen, the change is not to become more sophisticated. The change is not even to become more intelligent, though, though there's, no, uh, there's no bonuses in heaven or on earth for lack of intelligence, but that's not what he's talking about. The change is not to become more intelligent, to become more knowledgeable. Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Three things about children that I think that Jesus is talking about here. Number one, children are absolutely dependent upon their parents. Children are absolutely dependent. Adults are, tr seek to be independent. A I want you to think about this. A child, whenever a child has a need, how many people here have kids? How many of you got kids here? Especially got smaller kids, all right? Can you wave at me? All the people got kids? Oh, not, not too many. Some of you need to get married and have some kids. <laughs> I've got grandkid. Oh, man, granddaughter. It's awesome. Listen. <laughs> I saw a rumor laughing. It's true. A lot of these need to get... Am I right? A lot of these need to get married, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to have you ask your neighbor, what are you waiting for? But anyway... <laughs> Kids, listen, they don't even think about it. They, 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 don't, it's, it, they don't even have to, they don't, com, they, they don't compute. It's not logical. It's not, when a child has a need, automatically they go to their parents. It's just automatic. If a child has a need, the first thing they do is they go to mommy, to daddy, right? Whatever it is. If they need to be clean, they need to f have food, whatever need that they have, children automatically, without even thinking about it, children are absolutely dependent upon their parents. So the first shift that has to come place in our lives is that we become, number one, we become dependent, totally dependent upon God. You know, the world, the world tells you that you need to become a self-made man. Well, I feel sorry for anybody here that's a self-made man. God's Word says that we've got to become absolutely dependent upon Him. That we are like little children. Not only, not only are we dependent upon the Lord, but we are, and not only are we not independent, we become interdependent. Here's a shift that needs to take place. The, the world will tell you this. The world will tell you, in order to have success in life, in order to have, you know, a successful business, a successful company, in order to be successful in your studies, this is basically what the world says. It says, sheer determination, by willpower, by working hard, and listen, working hard is a good thing. You know, there's no, no sense in being lazy. But, but the world will tell you, by sheer determination, by willpower, by working hard, by getting ahead, by, by competition, the world tells you, you've got to compete with your neighbor. You've got to compete with your co-employees. Co you have to compete in class. You have to, the world will tell you, you've got to push and shove and fight and be absolutely determined in order to get ahead. In the kingdom of God, just the opposite. Just the opposite in the kingdom of God. There should be no competition in the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. There should be no competition in the kingdom of God. One more time. There should be absolutely no competition in the kingdom of God. Can somebody say amen? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. We are not competing with Cornerstone. We are not competing with Word of Hope. We are not competing with VCF. Those are all God's churches. We are happy when they grow. We are happy when they're filled. We're happy when people are saved. Amen. Amen. There's no competition in the kingdom of God, or there should be none. Unfortunately, in the church, there is some competition, which shouldn't be. Tell you, look at your neighbor really sternly and say, it should not be. Go ahead. Look at your neighbor. It should not be. There should be no competition in the kingdom of God. 
in the world's full of competition. And, and the world will tell you that in order to get ahead, you've got to compete. Just the opposite in the kingdom of God. Just the opposite. There's nobody up here trying to prove anything. The, all we want to do is to please our Heavenly Father. Amen, Baba. That should be the center of your, of your being. You're not competing, you know, to get on stage or competing with another ministry or competing for... Um, heaven forbid that you compete for, for cell members. Oh, my goodness. I'm a born-again cup, please. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't hear any. All right. We are not competing in God's kingdom. So children are, number one, they are dependent. They are dependent. And secondly, in God's kingdom, we become interdependent. We count on one another. We can't, we can't do it. You know, Christianity, the kingdom of God is not a, you know, there's, there's such things as a solo sport. There's such thing as team sports, right? If you watch the Olympics, you got like gymnastics. Usually, most of the time, gymnastics is a solo sport. So you, one person goes out and they perform, right? But, but the kingdom of God is not a solo sport. The kingdom of God is a team sport, amen? I tell you, one thing about, this is, this is not India to bola, this is really just the truth. But one thing I, I've seen about uh, Filipinos, you know, we, we, we love basketball, amen? Even though we're short, right? It <laughs> doesn't make any sense, right? But we love basketball. And I tell you, what, one area, and I'm not, this Indi bola at all. One area where Filipinos are way ahead even in the West, who are matatangkad, Filipinos are team players. They really are. It's, it's, it's part of our culture. We don't, Filipinos, you, you won't, on, on a Filipino basketball team, we won't put up with somebody trying to be the superstar. That person will just be out. You've got, tell your neighbor, you've got to be a team player. So it is in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? You've got to be a team player. That means, that means we're not looking to be superstars. When the team wins, everybody wins. Come on. When the team wins, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Everybody rejoices. Amen. So our services, I pray to God that, that our, our six services are not in competition. Amen. This, this 4 o'clock service is not competing with the 6.30 service. Or not. You know, I, no, I'm not going to tell that. Okay. All right. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 13. Matthew 19, 13. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. The disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The kingdom of heaven belongs to little children. Unless you change and become like a little ch child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The second thing that, that I believe that Jesus is talking about, first of all, is dependence. Second thing that Je I believe Je Jesus is talking about when he talks about little children. You know what? Little kids, they will believe anything. They'll believe anything you tell them. You know? You, you, can, you can frighten a kid. Or, or you can tell a kid, you know, and it's up to your parents. I'm not, I'm not trying to dictate to your parent, your parenthood, how you deal with your children. But, you know, some, some parents will tell their kids, about, I don't know about in the Philippines, but in, in, the, in the U.S., uh, some t kids will tell their, their kids, uh, some parents will tell their kids about Santa Claus. I'm not a big fan of Santa Claus. I think it's Jesus' birthday. We should celebrate Jesus, not Santa Claus. But, you know, it's, that's, you know, some, some parents will tell their kids in the, anyway, in, in, in the States anyway about the tooth fairy. Have you ever heard about the tooth fairy? Do they have the tooth fairy here? No, no, it's a good thing that you don't. <laughs> in the U.S., kapag uh, yung bata nawala yung ipin, yung, yung mga baby teeth, ba? yung baby teeth na nagpapalit. So, uh, to keep the kid from, being, to, from crying or to, uh, uh, to keep them be, being afraid that it might hurt, then they'll, they'll pull out a tooth and then they'll wrap it in a little piece of uh, uh, tissue paper and they'll, they'll tell their kid, they'll say, now tonight the tooth fairy is going to come. 
And he's going to get that tooth and leave you something. And so while their kid's asleep, you know, they put the tooth under the pillow. The kid goes to sleep. Then they get the, they get the, the tooth and then they put, you know, like a five peso coin or a ten peso coin. And the kid wakes up. Oh, the tooth fairy came and visited me, you know. So he's not afraid for his teeth to fall out. <laughs> K- kids will believe anything. They, they, just, they just believe what you say. Listen, listen. They believe usually without questioning, without logic, without analysis. As adults, and even Christian adults, come on, we want to analyze everything. Even when a miracle happens right in front of us, when we see a miracle right in front of us, instead of being like a little kid and rejoicing and giving God the glory, we analyze. Thank you for that. That's what I feel like. That's, that's exactly right. We want to analyze everything. Jesus said to his disciples, well, Jesus said to Jarius, remember Jarius? His daughter was very sick. And Jarius came to Jesus. And, and on, on their way, Jarius was able to convince Jesus to go back with him to pray for his, On the way, people came from Jarius' house and they told, they told Jarius, they said, Your daughter is dead. Come on. That's not good news. Jesus looked at Jarius and what did he say? Just believe. Tell your neighbor, just believe. Listen, there was nothing logical about that. There was nothing analytical about that. Listen, the reason that Jarius' daughter was raised from the dead because Jarius, did, he refused to analyze. He, refu- he didn't make a whole lot of questions. How did she die? When did she die? When did she? The, the reason Jesus interrupted, Jesus interrupted what the circumstances and situations were dictating. Jesus interrupted and said, just believe. Just believe. Jesus allowed Lazarus, he already knew that he was sick. Come on. Lazarus was one of the best friends. The whole family of Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were some of the best friends of Jesus. Close friends. Word came to Jesus that Lazarus was seriously ill on his deathbed. And Jesus purposely, purposely waited for four more days. Purposely. On purpose. Hear me. God doesn't always answer your prayers immediately. And he doesn't answer them on purpose. Purposely. The trying of your faith is more precious than gold. Jesus comes finally after four days. Knowing that Lazarus has already died. He knew it in the spirit. He told told his disciples. Lazarus is asleep. He said, well, Lord, if, if he's asleep, let's let, it, let him rest. He'll get better. And then he said, they, 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 then he had to tell him frankly, no, what I mean is Lazarus is dead. Jesus knew in his spirit that Lazarus was dead after 40. So he goes back, and uh, I can't remember which one came out to meet him. It was Mary or Martha, whichever one. Because they, they, he said, said to him later, finally the other one came, Makapatid, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Makapatid, Yan. Then the, the other one came, the other sister came and said, Lord, if you had been here, <clears throat> you could have healed my brother. Jesus said, he said these words. Look at your neighbor and say, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Kids just believe. They just believe. They have simple Childlike faith. 
If you want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to see the kingdom of God move in you and through you, in your family, in your finances, in your health, in your mind, in your heart, in your body, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to become like a little child. You know that your, listen, you know that your mind is renewed when the absolutely impossible seems logical. You know that your mind has been renewed when things that are absolutely crazy in your heart and your mind, you say, I know God can do that. He'll do that. It's so far out. That's when you know that your mind is renewed. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap for that. Amen. So children... They easily believe. They simply believe. Childlike faith. Childlike faith is what opens the door to the kingdom of heaven. Childlike faith. Another thing that you learn about children, especially when they get... I, I, I love... We, we've had three kids. And uh, I, I, I don't know why. But uh, for me, I almost wish you could freeze my kids at the age three. It's just the best age ever. Because they are like sponges, just, they, they are so, they're absorbing everything, they, qu- they have questions about everything, they're constantly learning, they, these kids, they're just learning so fast. Their minds are so inquisitive. They're, they're just, they just, they soak up like a sponge. They want to know, mommy about, mommy this, mommy that, daddy this, mommy that. They got all the, they're always learning. Hear me, listen to me. When you stop learning You've stopped growing. I tell you what, there's a whole lot of adults, there's a whole lot of Christians that come to a certain level in their Christian life when they think that they have arrived. Listen, if you think that you have arrived, if you think you know that you you know enough, then I'm guarantee I absolutely guarantee you, you've already you've reached your ceiling. You're going no further. Alam lahat ng kailan mo malaman bilang Kristiano, you, you, you're, you're not going up any further. You've hit your ceiling. Children are some of the most inquisitive people on the planet. They, they just want to learn. They have, they have this, they have this s- extreme desire to learn, to know more, to understand. They, they got question after question after question for mommy and daddy. Amen? They, they just keep asking questions. What about this and what about that? What about this and what about that? They're just, they're just, they're sponges. You can tell them anything. You can just, you could sit them for 24 hours. You could sit them and just feed their heads and their hearts and their minds with knowledge. They're just like sponges. When you cease learning, then you cease growing. If you don't know any more about God and about His kingdom, about, about the things of God, about God, if you don't know any more about God this year than you knew last year, then you're, you're not growing. And if you don't have a hunger to know more. Listen, I've been, I've been walking with God since 1977. Oh my goodness, that's almost 40 years. Oh, I'm getting old. I've been walking with God since 1977. The more I know, the more that I know that I don't know. Come on. The more I know about God, the more I realize there's so much more I don't know. He's huge. He's big. Children have this this tremendous desire to learn. They have this tremendous desire to, to ask questions. Not, not, questioning, not questioning God, not questioning the right and wrong. Not que- but they just want to learn. They just want to learn everything that they can learn. You want to enter the kingdom of God? Then you need to ask questions. Unless you change and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Let let me tell you some questions that you can ask yourself. 
Why is it when so-and-so prays for somebody, more than half the people they pray for get healed? But if I pray, I've got to pray for 10 or 20 people before they get healed. Why, why is that? That's not a bad question to ask if you're not competing. You're not competing, right? You're asking because you want to learn, right? How, how is it that Pastor Will Graham, if you were in any of the, any of the previous services, how is it that Pastor Will Graham can stand up here, pick out some of the audience, and prophesy over them, and nail them so much, several people have approached me this week and told me the prophecies that he spoke over their life. They were absolutely 100% accurate. How is that? But ganon. Why can't I do that? <laughs> it's not competition. It's a desire to learn. It's a desire to learn. And it's an understanding. Yeah, here's, here's another thing about kids. This is not my list. Here's another ki- thing about kids. They don't know about limitations. K- kids think they can do anything. Kids will put on a cape. They think they can fly like Superman. <laughs> I, caught my, I caught my daughter. She was probably, how old was she, honey? Was she maybe seven, eight, n- maybe nine years old when she was on the top of the house in Cabanatoan City. Seven years old. She had climbed up the water tank. The water tank had this big ladder. We had a two-story house. Seven years old, she climbed up the water tank and was sitting on the roof of the house. Now, she got a spanking for that. But K- kids, I tell you what, one thing about my youngest daughter, Christine Joy, to a fault, to a fault. I mean, it's a good, it's a good thing, but sometimes there needs to win. She has no fear at all. There's just absolutely no fear. She's just always been like that. She, one, time, one time in the house, she climbed up. On, she was just a little kid, just a little kid. She climbed up on the top of the uh, dresser drawer, uh, on top of the uh, aparador. She climbed up on the top and was foolish enough to jump down and hurt herself and cried. But she just, she's not afraid of anything. W- with kids, all things are possible. <laughs> Unless you change and become like a child, you never enter the kingdom of God. There has to be a paradigm shift in our hearts, in our minds. Instead of, instead of looking at Pastor Will and, and seeing him prophesy over people, one after, instead, of, instead of looking at somebody else and seeing them lay hands on the sick, you need to start to think, I can do that. I got the same Holy Spirit. That's not boasting. That's just the plain truth. Hey, did, did you know that there is no junior Holy Spirit? Do you know that the same Holy Spirit that lives in you lives in me? And that's the same Holy Spirit that lived in Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind, who called the lame, caused the lame to walk, who raised the dead to life again? I'll tell you what. You may think I'm crazy. I'm still looking forward to the day, and I believe it's going to happen before I die, when I see the dead raised to life again. Not because of anything, just because the King of Kings lives inside of me. He's more than capable of that. The same King of Kings lives inside of you. Come on. Unless you change and become like little children. Little children, nothing is complex. Everything is simple. They're not analytical. Come on. Come on. Little children, they're not analytical. They don't have to analyze any, everything. They just believe. They just believe that everything is possible. That nothing is impossible with God. Can somebody say amen? amen. Just believe. Didn't I tell you, if you would believe, you would see the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever heard the 
You ever heard the saying that uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Have you ever, ever heard that? Un unfortunately, that, sometimes that's true. I, I pray that never becomes true in my, in my life. I I'm an old dog. I hope you can teach me some new tricks. Some of you young people can teach me some things. This, this, this is mostly full of uh, y young people here, this, these afternoon services. Is there, is there anybody here my age? <laughs> I don't know if there is, or older. I, I tell you what, one, one thing that, don't let this happen to your life. Please don't let this happen to your life. One thing that happens in the life of older people, I see it happen so many times. May kasabihan nga sa Tagalog eh. Sabi nga sa Tagalog, anak, Papunta ka pa lang eh. Ako pabalik na eh. D don't ever let that attitude get in your heart, in your life. D don't ever let that attitude get that, that you can't learn. Hear me? Because it's just pride. It's just plain pride. Don't ever get that attitude that you can't learn from somebody younger than you. You know, we've got this kind of this hierarchy, you know. Lalo, lalo sa, sa Asia. Lalo, lalo kung may edad. Lalo, lalo kung puti na ang buhok mo. Kaya i-dye ko yung hair ko next week eh. <laughs> Paputi ang buhok mo eh. Parang, hindi mo pwedeng turuan eh. Ayaw makinig talaga eh. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Paputi ang buhok, ayaw makinig eh. Lalo, lalo kung mas bata sa kanila unless you change and become like a little child makasama kong puti ang buhok you will never enter the kingdom of God children are some of the most teachable people on the planet you can teach them anything they're hungry to learn the, the, the kingdom of God is for those who are hungry, who thirst and hunger for it. Amen? I tell you what, it's the, the, greatest, the greatest attribute that will open the presence of God in your life is hunger and thirstiness. Don't ever, don't ever be satisfied where you are. Now, th there's a balance of that. Obviously, there, there is a satisfaction that we have in Jesus. Amen? There, there is a peace that we have in the Lord. And, and we are to be satisfied with the things that we have. Don't, don't let material things... If you're, if you're looking for satisfaction in material things, you're looking in the wrong place anyway. Because if you have... If, if you own the iPhone... I'm, I was going to ask for a raise of hands, but I won't. If you own the iPhone 6, come on. You probably want the iPhone 7. I know I do. Right? I don't have the 6, but... And it's always going to be like that. So if you're, looking for sat if you're looking for contentment and satisfaction in material things, it's never, ever going to come. Never. You have a mansion in, in Forbes Park and, and, and 10 Mercedes Benz or, or, or Porsches or Lamborghini. You'll never be satisfied. Never. There's always going to be a desire, a hunger for more. Because it can never fill your heart and your life. So true satisfaction comes from Christ. But here's the, here's the thing that's so awesome about the Lord. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see. I just love that verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? It's better than lint chocolate. It's my favorite lint. <laughs> oh, taste and see. Well, once, you, once you have tasted of the goodness of God, once you've tasted of His presence, you are, you are ruined forever. Nothing else will ever satisfy. But you also begin to discover that you've, you've tasted of the Lord, there must be more. There must be more. Because He's so much bigger any encounter, and I believe in encounters of God. We've got Encountering God Retreat, November uh, 12th. I believe in, I've had so many encounters. Listen, 
any encounter with God that you've had, and that's a great thing, and you should rejoice in it, I can promise you there's a greater encounter with God. If you'll hunger and you'll thirst for the Lord. Tell your neighbor, stay thirsty. Alright, pwede tayong tumilahat, tayo po yung manalangin.